I get to, to take over as chair of this section and introduce the next speaker, which uh, I assume is you. Yes. This is our, our co-chair. So it's a very, it's a seamlessly organized meeting that uh, involves minimal uh, uh, excess energy. So uh, Mike Yaffe needs no introduction um, at all. Um, Mike, uh, I've known since he was a postdoc in Luke Hanley's lab. I will say that I have an introduction here that he wrote out no. Uh, for him. <laughs> no, actually I didn't. Um, but I, I just want to say one thing about Mike. Mike is both remarkable and crazy. Okay, That's so true. Mike and I are both MD PhDs, and most mere mortal MD PhDs, after completing their training, clinical training, if they do clinical training and their research training, pick one thing or the other to engage in. But Mike is Mike is one of those rare individuals who's a triple threat player. He stays involved clinically, and not only does he stay involved clinically, he's a surgeon, which is really <laughs> nuts. So he's uh, a really remarkable. I don't think he sleeps. Um, maybe he writes himself prescriptions for Adderall with the... <laughs> That's good. But, uh, That's all I mean. <laughs> okay, I'm never getting invited to MIT again. <laughs> First That's talk good. here. So uh, anyway, so, uh, so without yeah, any good. further ado, uh, we'll have Mike. <laughs> Okay. Thank you, Ben. I used to not need sleep. Oh, no, I'm good. I'm Mike. Okay. I used to not need sleep, but that was uh, before I had kids. <laughs> okay. okay, so what I'd like to tell you about today in the next 20 minutes or so, 25 minutes or so, is some work that we've been doing on how you can use dynamic rewiring of signaling networks, the same type of thing that Joan Brugge talked about earlier, um, in order to to optimize our ability to design rational combination therapies for cancer. And what we've been interested in, particularly, is the combinations of either chemotherapy drugs or chemotherapy and radiation, because those are, of course, the mainstays of how we treat uh, cancer. And the thing that my lab has been focused on primarily has been on studying the signaling networks that are involved in DNA damage, because that's the mechanism by which chemotherapy and radiation are used to cure cancer. But more recently, it's been the, the intersection of the DNA damage signaling network with protein kinases and cytokines, for example, a little bit now and cancer metabolism, and asking how these networks work together in the type of approach that uh, Doug Laufenberger talked about uh, in order to control what the fate of cells is. Now, before I get there, I just want to put in one quick plug for this new journal called Science Signaling. It's the first offshoot of science uh, that, was, that there is, and it's, of course, focused on the topic that's near and dear to all of our hearts, and that's signaling. And I would encourage all of you uh, to send your very best papers to science signaling. Forget nature, forget cell. You want to send them to science signaling. Um, the chief editor of, of science signaling uh, is a nice guy. And the editor, the, the overall editor, Nancy Goff, is here at the meeting. And so I'd encourage you afterwards during the drinks to go up and say hi. OK. I want to make three main points in my talk. If you, don't, if you sleep through everything else, I hope you'll remember these three points. The first is that targeting monotherapies for cancer, the stuff that, that you've heard about from, uh, from Jeff Settlement today and you heard about uh, from earlier speakers, uh, uh, they're fantastic things. But they don't cure the disease. They result, as you've seen, in impressive rem remissions of, of the tumor, um, and sometimes for prolonged periods of time. But ultimately, the disease recurs in all the patients if they live long enough. The second thing I want to tell you is that most forms of combination chemotherapy aren't actually synergistic. Now this is different than what I was taught because I was taught that the reason we gave combination chemotherapy like CHOP for, for uh, leukemia or lymphoma was because the drug somehow acted synergistically but the data that's begun to emerge suggests that in fact that's not the case at all. That the reason that those drugs work is because they target heterogeneity in the tumor cell population. So cytoxane for example targets one set of drugs uh, and, and vincristin or vinblastine targets a, different, uh, uh, targets a different set of cells and so in fact it's not personalized medicine. I would argue it's depersonalized medicine. Now, the advantage of the fact that we use these different drugs is they don't have overlapping toxicities. But the disadvantage is we're really not making the best use that we could of combination chemotherapy. And if we want to cure cancer, what we have to do is come up with an effective way to identify synergistic combinations. And I'm going to make the, the, the plea that the answer comes from systems biology. The idea is that we can use, and I'm going to show you this, time-dependent network rewiring to sensitize cells in a predictable way to drugs. We can use this, in essence, to funnel cells down a pathway that we want them to go down and then clobber them. Okay? And this may be particularly important for killing cancer stem cells. Whatever it is that you think these stem-like cells are, whether those are cells that have moved backwards of the type that Rudy talked about or the type that Joan talked about on the outside of those uh, spheroids, I think this is an approach that's going to be particularly useful uh, 
uh, for that. The other advantage I'll show you is that we can use these systems insights not necessarily to indicate that there are new drugs we have to go out there and discover, but maybe we can take the same old drugs we already have and use them in more effective ways. Okay. Now, since I'm going to make a plea about systems biology, I have to tell you what it is. And the great thing about systems biology, the thing I like best about it is it's whatever you want it to be. Whatever you do, if you want to call it systems biology, it's okay with me. The approach, the definition I like best is the one that Craig Venter made. And he said, basically, it's we got to get out of that one postdoc, one protein, three-year mindset and change it to studying, what does he call it here? He says we have to study integration of thousands of proteins. I don't know if we can do thousands, but at least more than one in a dynamically changing environment. Okay. Now, the way that we've been focused on this at MIT, uh, inspired largely by the work of Doug Laufenberger, is to think of biological circuits much in an analogy to electrical circuits. Now, obviously, this is our, an electrical circuit, and this is our biological circuit. And of course, since my lab is, is really focused on signaling and protein kinases in particular, I'm going to make the, the argument that protein phosphorylation basically works like electrons flowing through wires to communicate. And that's the current of signaling. Okay. Now, if you wanted to study what was happening in an electrical circuit, you wouldn't sit there with a voltmeter and measure the voltage at one point and say, ah, oh, I understand how this complicated circuit works because I've measured the voltage at one point. But somehow it's okay if we measure ERK activity, right, in one cell line in response to one stimulus and we pretend we understand it. What you really want to do is you want to take a circuit and you want to measure, uh, using what's called a bed of nail testers, the voltages and currents at thousands of nodes. And at least what we want to do with biological circuits is to measure metaphorically the activities of multiple signaling proteins, MEC and ERK and EGF, for example, junk, P38, caspase 8, at as many points in time as we can under realistic conditions. OK. And we're going to, and again, I, you know, my lab, and I think I, spe I can speak fairly for Forrest White's lab and Peter Sorger's lab, we've all drunk the same Kool-Aid um, that Doug cooks up. And that, is the, and that is the belief that we can understand things through a multivariate network model, the so-called Q signal response model. And the idea is that if we stimulate cells, I'm sorry, this seems to be dying here. If we, can, if we stimulate cells uh, with DNA damaging agents and we measure their response, in particular, how well can we kill them, that the death we measure must be some function of the input as mediated through the signaling network. So the idea is let's measure as many signals as we can and we'll, let's make the assumption that the response we see is some function of the signals. And all we have to do is decode what the function is that relates the signals to the responses and then we'll know exactly what we need to do. Oh, it's fantastic. Thank you. Ah, wow. Wow, that's powerful. See, when, you're the, when, when you run the Koch Institute, I guess you can have that kind of power. <laughs> I'm going to give this to you in a very concrete example, a cancer treatment example. And this is an example that Mike Lee in the lab has worked on. Part of this is published, and I'll show you new data at the end that is not. Now, Mike was very interested in trying to ask, could we improve the treatment of breast cancer? And the particular type of breast cancer that Mike was interested in treating is a type called triple negative breast cancer. Well, as Ben knows, and many of you may know, uh, Breast cancers, historically, before people studied them by gene expression analysis, were identified by a pathologist as what type they were. They were called either, well, we didn't even call them luminal. They were called either estrogen and progesterone receptor positive tumors. That is, they had hormone receptors. Or if they didn't, they overexpressed the EGF receptor family member, HER2. And if they were negative for estrogen receptors and negative for progesterone receptors, and they didn't overexpress HER2, well, they had three strikes, so they were called triple negative breast cancers. Now, the problem with triple negative breast cancers is they affect young women primarily, and they have the absolutely worst prognosis. These we know what to do with, at least a little bit. We can use antagonists of estrogen and progesterone receptors. These guys, we can use HER2-directed therapies, but there's no good therapy for triple negative breast cancer. Now, a subset of breast cancers overexpress the EGF receptor, and that's somewhat overrepresented, about 50 to 75 percent of triple negative breast cancers. So maybe there's something we can do with this. And so our rationale was what we would do would be to combine the things that we were interested in, DNA damaging drugs or treatments, for example, like ionizing radiation or camptothecin or cisplatinum or etoposide, with specific signaling pathway inhibitors, like that BEZ drug that you heard about earlier. And we would ask, could we find some combination of drugs that we could use that might be particularly effective? And the, the, the combination that I'll tell you about, ah, one thing made this different. So of course, all of you that are in industry and all of you um, that are interested in this from an academic point of view have already probably thought up and tried these experiments where you mix drugs together. But we reasoned, because of some work we had done over the years on systems biology, that maybe there was a little tweak we could do that would make things different. Maybe what we could do was instead of just mixing the drugs and seeing what happened, we could give one drug and we could wait. 
And then later on, we could give the second drug. Or we could give, the, give this green drug first, for example, and then later on give the blue drug. And we reasoned that maybe things would happen over time between when we gave the first drug and the second drug that might change the outcome. And the two drugs that I'm going to tell you about today are doxorubicin, uh, adriamycin, a DNA-damaging drug that causes double-strand breaks, and erlotinib, an EGF receptor inhibitor. And the point I want to make first is, you know, doxorubicin and erlotinib are both clinically out there used for the treatment of triple negative breast cancer. Now, when we first started to do these experiments, all of my friends who treat patients with breast cancer said to me, Mike, you're wasting time. What do you want to do this for? It's already been done in culture, and there's very little, there's very little benefit from mixing the two drugs together. And there have been three clinical trials where people have given patients erlotinib and doxorubicin, and the benefit is really minimal. And that's what I'm showing you here. This is the percentage of apoptotic cells. This is a triple negative breast cancer cell line in a dish. And we're looking at apoptosis. If we give them erlotinib for 8 or 36 hours, or we treat them with doxorubicin, or we put the two drugs in together. And you can see if we mix the drugs, there's a little bit more apoptosis, but certainly nothing impressive. But what Mike noticed was that if he simply waited, if he gave the erlotinib first and waited, and then somewhere between 1 and 48 hours later gave the doxorubicin, he could find conditions where the cell death increased 500%. If you reverse the order, he damaged the DNA first with doxorubicin, then he gave erlotinib. In fact, not only was it not beneficial, but he got less death than he would have gotten if he'd even given doxorubicin alone. This was antagonistic. Okay. Now, to make life easy, I'm very fortunate because doxorubicin starts with D and it damages DNA. So wherever you see the letter D, think DNA damage. And erlotinib, which targets the EGF receptor, happens to also begin with E. So wherever you see E, think EGF receptor. And wherever there's an arrow, it means I'm going to do one thing first, wait, and then I'm going to do the other thing. So E arrow D means block the EGF receptor, wait, damage DNA. Okay? And this is the result I've shown you. In fact, if you do a chow Talele analysis, this is synergistic. You can increase the death remarkably if you simply give a drug that's already out there, wait, and then give the second drug. But it only works in triple negative breast cancer cells. If you do the very same thing in a different cell line, this is a cell line that overexpresses the HER2 oncogene, not only don't you get an increase in death, in fact, you get a decrease. You get, this is antagonistic. You're worse off here than if you just gave doxorubicin alone. In luminal cells, estrogen and progesterone receptor expressing cells, if you do this time staggered treatment, you get a little bit more death, but it turns out not to be synergistic. And in a cell line that's annotated as being normal breast cells, you get almost no death. Notice the maximum is 5%, nothing happens. So this is treatment that's somehow specific to these triple negative breast cancer cells. Now, if you're a signaler, there's a problem that's going to bother you about this. And here's the problem. The problem is if I look at what happens to EGF receptor activity by phosphorylation of the EGF receptor or, or activation of ERK activity, all that activity is over in 15 minutes. But I showed you to get maximal effect, I had to wait eight hours. So if the EGF receptor inhibition happens in minutes, why do I have to wait hours to see the synergistic killing? Well, let me dismiss one possibility right away. You might say, well, that's easy, Mike. It's an off-target effect. It has nothing to do with the EGF receptor at all. You gave her erlotinib, and all kinds of weird stuff happened that was independent of the EGF receptor. So what Mike Lee did was he used RNAi against the EGF receptor. He knocked down the levels of the EGF receptor. And if you knock down the EGF receptor and you give doxorubicin, you get just essentially almost as much killing as you get with the time stagger treatment. And if on top of that you now add erlotinib, you, don't, you, you really don't get any benefit. So it's going through the EGF receptor. For the sake of time, I'm going, to, I'm going to simply tell you the punchline of the next part, which is if you, because it took hours, it must mean something is different. And so I did what, we, what in my lab we always say you do when you run out of alternatives, and that's you do gene expression analysis. And you ask, OK, what, what, what can I get out of this? And this turned out to be very revealing. What it showed us, in fact, was that about 20 different pathways were all being downregulated. But the overall signature of gene expression, that is, what all those pathways came together to tell us was this was a signature of the RAS oncogene. So it meant, in fact, that the EGF receptor signaling seemed to be driving the expression of a RAS oncogene expression signature, and that these triple negative breast cancer cells might be oncogene addicted to that RAS oncogene expression signature because of the EGF receptor. And when we blocked it chronically, but not acutely, that is four to eight hours, we could wean the cells off of their oncogene addiction and basically wean them off of the expression signature that goes along with RAS oncogene addiction. In fact, if you use the, the um, uh, GSEA data set at the Broad, the, the, um, 
what it looks like is everybody who does an experiment where they knock down RAS or they knock down MYC gets a signature that looks like what we saw when we chronically suppress the EGF receptor. Okay. So of course we're signalers and this symposium is about signaling, so let me tell you the signaling punchline. What's the signaling mechanism? Ah, finally a signaling network. Okay. So what we wanted to understand was what was the relationship between, for example, the, these growth factor receptor pathways and the DNA damage we were inducing with doxorubicin, and how did this somehow feed into things that were controlling cell death or proliferation or DNA damage repair or non-apoptotic death or autophagy. And so Mike Lee set out to measure as much of this stuff as he could. And he worked out assays over the course of a few months that could measure basically everything that you see here, uh, shown everything, he could measure everything shown here in white and about these days about a third of the things shown here in gray. So he could measure a reasonable amount of signals that were in all of these different pathways. Now, this is a terrible slide. And I say it's a terrible slide because what I've just done is reduced about nine months of Mike's life to one slide, two slides actually. And what I'm showing you here is a summary of measurements of every one of those signaling molecules that he could measure in three different cell lines, triple negative breast cancer cells, HER2 overexpressing cells, luminal cells, in which under all six different conditions. So every one of these panels, this panel right here, represents, for example, this is ERK activity. This is phosphorylation of ERK in those cells, in the triple negative breast cancer cells treated with doxorubicin or erlotinib or the three different combinations, dox and erlotinib together, dox first and then erlotinib, erlotinib first and then doxorubicin. And to make life easy, I'm just going to color code them for you. If the, if the signal went up early, it's shaded green. If it went up late, it's shaded red. If it went up and back down again, we call that transient, it's shaded in yellow. If it was high and went down, that's shaded in blue. And the strength is obviously the height of the bar. So this is all the signals that we could measure. And he did this using a combination of micro-Western blotting that was very quantitative. Spent a long time making sure that if we said the increase in ERK was 1.8 fold, it was really 1.8 fold. It wasn't 2.8 fold and it wasn't 1.3 fold. It was really 1.8 fold plus or minus some small variance. He also did this using reverse phase lysate arrays. And now we had this big compendium of signals that we might be able to use to understand why these cells were sensitive to a particular treatment, but these other cell types weren't. Mike also measured responses. So what he measured, of course, was apoptosis, proliferation, where they were in the cell cycle, and autophagy. And this, again, was all relatively straightforward. You could measure cell survival, for example, by measuring ATP content in the cells. You could look at where they were in the cell cycle by using FACs. And if you, if, if you stayed for phosphohistone H3 by FACs, then the cells that were here with 4N DNA content, but up here with phosphohistone H3, these were mitotic cells. So you could quantitate how many cells were in G1, how many were in G2, how many were in M, and how many were in S. And you could stain the cells for cleave PARP and cleave caspase 3 to figure out how many were apoptotic. And then you could transfect the cells with GFPLC3 and count puncta after DNA damage is a marker of autophagy. So now we had signals and we had responses and we could ask what signals correlated with what responses and how did that account for why these cells appear to die when we use that time stagger treatment. And again, we're going to, I'm going to follow Doug's lead here and tell you that the way we did this was rather than looking at things the way I was used to looking at things as a signaler, which would be plotting things like ERK activity or junk activity as a function of time, building a signaling space in which each axis was a different signal. So junk might be this axis, ERK might be this axis, H2AX would be this axis, and asking what direction can I walk? Now, of course, we have 35 signals, so it's 35-dimensional signaling space. And we want to ask, what direction do I walk in 35-dimensional signaling space that most correlates with apoptosis or most correlates with cell cycle arrest or most correlates with autophagy? And the best predictor, so of course, what we're doing, of course, um, is we're finding the principal components, the directions we walk that capture the signal. And I can tell you that a simple two-component model did a pretty good job of measuring a lot of the things, particularly apoptosis. So the first principal component turned out to, to correlate with whether cells were surviving or dying. The dead cells were over here. The surviving and proliferating cells were over here. The second principal component, I don't really understand. It must have something to do with the cell cycle, because M phase cells are up here, and G2 cells are here, and S and G1 cells are here. But it's hard to put a simple biological meaning on it. Nonetheless, if you take these two principal components, you can do a phenomenally good job at predicting cell death under any of those DNA damage conditions. It's a, it, it works really well. If you say, oh, I'm going to give the cells this much 
erlotinib and I'm going to wait and give them this much doxorubicin, how much death will I get? And you build a model with conditions that you haven't tested. So you take the data from the condition you're not going to examine, and you build a model, and then you do take the condition you're interested in, you make the measurements, you dump it in, and you say, with these signals, how much death do you predict you'll get? How much death do you measure you get? You see it's bang one. Really works well. So the model works. But more importantly, the model can give you biological insight. You can go back to the model and say, why did this model work? What is special in triple negative breast cancer cells about pre-treating them with erlotinib and then clobbering them with doxorubicin that makes the cells die? And so what I'm showing you here is something called the variable importance and projection. I'm going to take all those signals and I'm going to ask for BT20 cells, if you would just focus on the, the blue lines, I'm going to rank the signals from most important to least important in predicting death. And what the model says is the most important signal, it's important in predicting the death you get with that time-staggered approach is cleaved caspase 8. That's the biggest blue bar you see. Furthermore, not only is it the most important signal for the triple negative cells, for all those other cell types, the, trip, the HER2 overexpressors and the um, luminal cells shown in red and green, you see it's the least important predictor. It's only important in those triple negative breast cancer cells. This was great. We were all very excited until we looked in the literature. Because it doesn't make sense. And the reason I say it doesn't make sense is because when you damage cells with doxorubicin and you cause intrinsic DNA damage, that's supposed to signal through the intrinsic death pathway, which is mediated by caspase 9 and caspase 3. And I just told you that the model said the critical thing was caspase 8. Caspase 8 has nothing to do with the intrinsic death pathway. Caspase 8 is involved in an extrinsic death pathway that you see here. And so I said to Mike Lee, who had done the work, I said, Mike, that's great, really exciting, except it can't be right, because the, after all, that's not what the literature says. So Mike said, let's see what the model says. Let's make a model of those triple negative breast cancer cells that captures the cell death we saw, and let's take caspase 8 out. And if you take caspase 8 out, what the model says is the biggest difference you're going to see is if you do that pretreatment, the thing that killed all the cells. But what the model says is if you give the two drugs together, you're not going to see a big change. And furthermore, the model says that if you look at those other cell types, the HER2 overexpressing cells with caspase 8, without caspase 8, not a big difference. Mike then used RNAi to test it. He knocked down caspase 8 in both of these cell types, and he made the measurements. And to my surprise and delight, I think you can see here that the signaling data for the, that we observed for the triple negative breast cancer cells perfectly mimicked what the model said. We specifically lost the increased death that we saw with the pretreatment. Now, this is important, I would argue, because it means we now have a biomarker. It means not only do we have a mechanism that explains the death, we have a biomarker that we can use if we decide to do this in patients for following if they respond. We can look at the tumors after treatment and ask, do we see cleave caspase 8? If we do, then we know it must be working through this mechanism. Now, is this the cure-all for all triple negative breast cancers? I, I was excited. We wrote the paper up. We sent it off. We were all excited. Reviews came back and said, that's great. Uh, you can cure BT20 cells now in a dish. <laughs> show, it, show us that it's true in general. So we looked at 10 different triple negative breast cancer cells. And I'd like you to just focus, please, on this black, the black bar, which is the, the condition I showed you where you give the EGF receptor inhibitor, you wait, and then you damage the DNA. And in every case, except one, in every case except one, it's the most effective at killing. But it's only synergistic if you do a Chow-Talele analysis in 40% of the cell lines. Only these four show synergistic killing between time-staggered EGF receptor inhibition and DNA damage. Why? What's special about these four cell types compared to the six that it wasn't synergistic in? And I would have said, well, I bet it has to do with EGF receptor expression levels. Maybe it only works in cells that have a lot of EGF receptor expression. After all, there have been many, many laboratories, some quite famous and national laboratories at that, who are devoted to showing you that we should be measuring mRNA levels of these things and using that to tell which patients ought to be on which drugs. And so what we did was to look at the cells, the amount of death that we saw at eight hours in response to the different treatments, and I'm showing you, them to you here. What I want to do is I want to normalize these to the amount of death we see relative to doxorubicin alone. So if when we add the erlotinib, we get no difference compared to erlotinib alone, we'll make that light yellow. And if we get the most synergy, we'll make that black. And I've ranked these cells from those that show the, the most synergy to those that show the least synergy. And here I'm showing you the levels of EGF receptor that are expressed in the cells. But I'd like you to notice that there's no correlation. 
There's no correlation if you use EGFR protein levels. There's no correlation if you use EGFR mRNA levels. And so everyone that tells you you're going to be able to figure out what drug to put your patient on by measuring their mRNA levels of signaling molecules, sorry, I'm going to tell you they're, they're lying to you. They're selling you the same bill of goods that Romney is. <laughs> now, sorry. <laughs> it's the only political crack I'll make. But if instead of looking at EGF receptor levels, you look at phosphorylation of the receptor, you look at how much is that cell line signaling through the EGF receptor in the absence of any stimulus, it's a beautiful correlation. It's those cells that under basal conditions are signaling the most through the EGF receptor. Those are the guys that are addicted, and those are the ones who show not only the most apoptosis with the combination time stagger treatment, but they're also the ones that show the cleavage of caspase 8. Okay? And so I think what this gives us is a biomarker for patient selection. We can select the patients who would benefit from this time staggered approach by, by asking which patient's tumors have the highest levels of phospho-EGFR. Now, I learned a lot of things from Tyler at the Koch Institute. And one of the things that, that I learned the most about was that you can't cure cancer with cells in a Petri dish. You have to do it in a mouse, right? If you can do it in a mouse, you're one step better. Now, and so we, we set out to do that experiment. We took, we took uh, triple negative breast cancer cells. In this case, it's not, it's not the perfect mouse that Tyler would have me use. It's a xenograft and a nude mouse, but it's at least a step in the right direction. And we tried treating them either, either uh, with the drugs in the combination I showed you or giving the drugs together, and we looked at what happened. Now, in these experiments, what I'm showing you is tumor growth is a function of time in these xenografts. And when the tumors get to be about this size, we can't, at this point, uh, our animal care people say the tumors are too big, you have to stop the experiment. This is what the tumors do by themselves. And where you see this arrow, we're going to give these mice one dose, one single dose of doxorubicin. And when we do that, the tumors regress a little bit, and then they pick up and keep growing again. If we give the two drugs together, just like was done in all the clinical trials. We give doxorubicin and erlotinib at the same time. We get a little bit more of a reduction in the tumor size, but it picks up and keeps growing. But in this experiment, if we gave a dose of erlotinib, and 12 hours later, we came back and we gave those mice one dose of doxorubicin, not only did the tumor shrink, but at least over the course of the experiment, it never grew back. Would it grow back if we went out further? Probably. But certainly, this was very encouraging data. And so the model at this point is that we think that a subset of triple negative breast cancer cells are addicted through the EGF receptor to an oncogene signature that masks this caspase 8 death pathway. So when we use DNA damaging chemotherapies, we can only kill them through that intrinsic death pathway. But that we can dynamically rewire those signaling pathways, just like Joan talked about, so that if we chronically suppress the EGF receptor with our lotinib, we can wean them off their oncogene addiction unmask this caspase 8 pathway, and now the same amount of DNA damage gives us increased death because there are two death pathways that we can activate. Let me leave you with a few very quick slides. First, is this only true in triple negative breast cancer cells? No. In fact, it's true in lung cancer. What I'm showing you here are, are EGFR mutant lung cancer cells treated with doxorubicin, a drug, in fact, that we don't use in the clinic because it's not very effective. But in fact, you can see it's dramatically effective if you simply pretreat these, uh, these triple negative, these lung cancer cells with erlotinib and then come back with doxorubicin later. The mechanism seems to be the same. We see caspase 8 activated only in the pretreatment condition, and we dramatically reduce the synergistic death that we see if we knock out caspase 8 using RNAi. So it looks like it's true in this subset of lung cancer cells. Here's an even more paradoxical response. Now, these are A549 cells. Now, these cells have a wild-type EGF receptor. In fact, they have a RAS mutation. I would have thought RAS being downstream of the EGF receptor, these would, would show no synergy. But in fact, it's even more impressive. Here's a cell line. doesn't do anything if you treat it with doxorubicin. You give it erlotinib, not much happens. You give the two drugs together, not much happens. But if you give the erlotinib and you wait and you allow the cells to rewire, now doxorubicin results in a dramatic increase in cell death. And again, it's only in this condition that you activate caspase 8 cleavage, and you can dramatically reduce that synergy if you get rid of caspase 8 or reduce it using RNAi. Well, maybe this is something that's unique to the EGF receptor. Maybe it'll only work with the EGF receptor. Let me convince you or try to convince you that this is true in an even broader sense. Maybe this is true with receptor tyrosine kinase signaling in general. So this is the data that I showed you before. 
This was the data where I showed you that triple negative breast cancer cells could be synergistically killed in this black bar if we pre-treated with the EGF receptor inhibitor, wait, come back with doxorubicin. And this was the data I showed you earlier, that if we took HER2 overexpressing cells, there if we pre-treated, we got less death. It was antagonistic. And we reasoned that maybe that was because HER2 cells, instead of being addicted to the EGF receptor, were addicted to HER2. So what if we used a HER2 inhibitor instead of an EGF receptor inhibitor? In that case, we saw that we could, we, could syn uh, syn we could synergistically increase the amount of death we got. And again, what's interesting here is you get a fair amount of death even if you just mix lapatinib and doxorubicin. But the best killing you get is if you do that time-staggered approach. You block the HER2, you block HER2 and DGFR, in this case with lapatinib, wait, and then come back with doxorubicin. Very last slide, La last piece of data I want to tell you. Now, you might say, well, that's all well and good, but, you know, pharmacokinetics in patients is a lot harder than being able to add things to media and cell culture. How are you ever going to get conditions right in a patient where you're going to be able to get the concentration of erlotinib in the tumor at the right amount at the right time to be able to then hit them with, with, a do with doxorubicin? And so recently we've teamed up with Paula Hammond, a chemical engineer in the Koch Institute, to try to build nanoparticle-based drugs that have an outer shell that releases an EGF receptor inhibitor and an inner core that then releases doxorubicin. So we can program this time-staggered release directly in a single drug. So the way that we've been doing this is to use a combination of, of uh, use a PLGA scaffold in which the erlotinib is free-floating and the doxorubicin is both free and tethered to the scaffold so that you've got basically an outer shell of erlotinib, an inner shell of doxorubicin uh, linked to the PLGA. And what you get, in essence, is rapid release of erlotinib followed by lo lo uh, lower dose sustained release uh, uh, of doxorubicin. And again, this is the result I showed you earlier. This is cell death over time when you use that time-staggered approach where you give the erlotinib, also called Tarceva, that's why it says T, and then you follow that with doxorubicin. If we use these nanoparticles alone, or we use nanoparticles that only release the EGF receptor inhibitor, or nanoparticles that only contain doxorubicin, you don't see very much. If we use particles that have doxorubicin and we give erlotinib to the mice, uh, uh, sorry, we give erlotinib uh, you know, this is in mice. We give erlotinib to the mice. We get a little bit of death. But the best death we get is if we use a particle that simultaneously releases erlotinib quickly and doxorubicin later. So we can recapitulate what we saw using two drugs time staggered by one drug, one nanoparticle that has time delayed release of doxorubicin with early release of erlotinib. Okay. And again, it's only with those particles that we see this activation of caspase 8. So, what I've told you about today is how I think we can use context-dependent rewiring of signaling pathways to get results that you wouldn't see with one drug alone or a second drug alone if you use the drugs in an intelligent way that you can get enlightened by by systems biology. I've told you the EGF receptor pathway crosstalks with the DNA damage pathway in a subset of triple negative breast cancer cells, and that you can use this, uh, uh, this crosstalk ordinarily limits the efficacy of cytotoxic chemotherapy. You can rewire, dynamically rewire those pathways uh, in a manner that suppresses the signaling through the EGF receptor to bring up a new response, cleavage of caspase 8, and you can get insight into that from systems biology. And this idea of dynamic rewiring isn't just limited to the EGF receptor, but I think is a general approach that you can use to discover novel combination therapies and potentially use this to find new ways of doing drug delivery. So that creates both new scientific challenges and can create new IP for old drugs. Of course, what we have to do now is we have to test these systems-based insights about dynamic rewiring. We have to test this in, in, in other things like cancer stem cells, better mouse models of the type that Tyler's lab generates, and potentially in the clinic, since both of the drugs I talked about are already approved for the treatment of triple negative breast cancer. I'll stop here. Thank you for your attention and simply tell you that all the work I told you about was really done by one fantastic postdoc, Mike Lee, together with the help from people shown here. And it built on work that Alex Gardino, who's in the audience, Andrea Tatner, and Jerry Ostheimer had done. Thank you very much. We have time for a couple of questions. I, I just want to ask one question. So do you know what the death receptor is that's triggered? So I, 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 I assume it's a death receptor. Uh, we, we thought that this was due to that extrinsic pathway through a death receptor, and we can't actually find evidence that that's true. Um, 
I can tell you that when you look at gene expression, it doesn't look like death receptors in particular are upregulated. And furthermore, when we take media from, each, from erlotinib pretreated cells and then put that on fresh cells and then give doxorubicin, it doesn't cause death. So if it's through that pathway, it's probably intracellular rather than release of a ligand into the media. Is it density dependent? I don't know. We haven't tried. Did you actually check whether uh, doxorubicin gets into the nucleus? So for many of the cell lines you show, doxorubicin actually doesn't get into the nucleus at all. So an alternative explanation is that a lot of pretreatment might simply downregulate the mechanism that keeps doxorubicin. I mean, that was, you know. There so was you can make use of the fact that doxorubicin is fluorescent. And so you can follow the fluorescence intensity increase over time. And if you compare doxorubicin treatment alone with or without um, pretreatment, it's exactly the same. The dotted curves for one hour, the solid curves for four hours, we thought about that. So there's no difference in doxorubicin treatment. In fact, there's no difference in the amount of DNA damage that it causes. And there's no difference in where the cells are in the cell cycle with the pretreatment. So it's, in fact, it's not a difference in the signaling. I'm sorry, it's not a difference in the, the cell cycle stage or the extent of DNA damage. It's the signaling between the DNA damage and the response that seems to be different. An excellent question. Okay, I think that, uh, Joan, one quick well, question. Related to yours, ben, in terms of what depth like, did you try overexpression of fat or downregulation of bid? So we're trying, C, we're, trying, um, we're trying C-flip right now. I suspect that some of this has to do with C-flip regulation. But the problem is every time we knock down C, C-flip is really tricky because the levels of it, you can either get more death or less death when you overexpress it or knock it down, depending on the extent to which you do it. And so these experiments have proved to be much trickier than I thought they would. But that's exactly what we're looking at. Haven't looked. Good, good point. We, we, we haven't looked. Okay. Well, thanks, Mike.